Hey guys, how you doing? It's Wolfden Podcast time. Everybody, settle down. Come here. Come here. Come come here. Ah, oh, yeah, baby. How you doing? Welcome. Hi, Will. Hey. What, what's the problem? I my allergies have been a goddamn disaster mm. all week. I thought you were crying. No, I'm like trying to like <laughs> wipe the snot out of my mustache mm. discreetly. Mm. So if you hear a lot of sniffling and blowing of the noses and just a lot of ah, that that's me. Hi, I'm Will. Well, I have a similar problem, Will. You yeah. see the shot that I just pulled for my coffee was uh-huh. very quick. Okay. So it's bad. Oh. And I'm having a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> So this will be a fun. So it's podcast. like equally as gross. Yeah. We're both going through it. Also, I haven't really pooped in two days. So oh, I don't got that problem. Oh, I, ho- I hope this isn't the time where I gotta go poop because the bathroom's right there. In fact, I pooped right before you came. Oh, so it's yeah. all warmed up for you. Oh, perfect. Yeah, just like living at home again. <laughs> this is what you guys came here for, right? Yeah, this is what you wanted to hear yeah. us talk about. Our- bodily functions oh yeah baby or not functioning in my case <laughs> skinny jamaican says two days bro is backed up anyway yep. uh today we want to talk about the rog ally yes by asus yes because i got to get my grubby little hands on it last week yes uh and the embargo broke today actually and a lot of people are talking about it so i'll talk about it uh, we're also going to talk about the Indie World Showcase that happened. Yes. I guess we'll just go through it really quickly. Yeah. Um, and some other stuff. What are these other things? Uh, it's a couple of random things. We have, um, did Hi-Fi Rush make money? Well, it was it was a success. But how do you define a success in this day of Game Pass? I am interested in that because I did hear that come up on yeah. Twitter. Uh, f- also patches for Scarlet and Violet. Uh, the Red Cross issues a challenge to gamers out there. Okay. Uh, f- bunch of news on Sony. Uh, the FTC uh, wants more info on Call of Duty on Switch. I see that they're doing some nefarious things with Steam. I definitely want to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> uh, f- and a lot more. It's it's a it's a bit of a hodgepodge week. A bit of a hodgepodge. We got we got good stuff to talk about, but it's it's uh, from all over the gaming spectrum. If you okay, will. If we'll you do that. Will. We'll do all that stuff. Okay, but first, all we this got, and more. We got some notifications from yes. George McFarlane with twenty five months. Says, oh my God, it's Will and Bob too. I guess. Hey, bros, how's the day been? It's been all right. We can't poop. How's your day been? <laughs> 360 degrees of Tasmania. Thanks for the fifteen months. What kind of bees make milk? <laughs> boobies okay i would, get it would mario's parents be considered mario makers oh this is he's there's oh, gonna he's be a lot of going groups. for it there's gonna be a lot of groups it. here <laughs> tinder is for rookies is that the is that the whole joke <laughs> oh no keep going go to facebook marketplace and search for a wedding dress ah <laughs> that's good uh no that's now that might sound like easy mode yeah um this will show you recently divorced women. Oh, yeah. We got it. We got it. <laughs> From there, you can search by size. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, now. You okay. know what? Better search than Tinder. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right. Let's just get to the ROG. The ROG ally. I have to pronounce these things correctly. Yes. Or else I'm gonna you got in trouble. Yes. I have gotten in trouble. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I this is this is an article by Engadget that we're going to read because I didn't take notes or anything <laughs> when I was there. It there was an event in Brooklyn last week. Uh, it 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 was hell getting there. It was right. two hours of traffic going, and two hours of traffic coming back. Um, was not worth it. Like <laughs> it it was just. They sh- it was just a guy doing a slideshow, like a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, they had they had. Let me tell you, they had great lox sandwiches. They were little tiny oh, little guys. They nice. were good. Yeah. So that that made it a little worth <laughs> it. Uh, also, there's a great coffee shop around the block called Devotion. It was very nice. It was it was in the presentation was in this building that I actually went to once to look at an apartment. Oh, yeah. There were apartments like above where this event was that okay. I was going to live in. But anyway, um, they were way too fucking expensive. <laughs> so uh, 
they had their little event. Uh, there was a there was a PowerPoint presentation basically on all of the specs and all the new stuff about the Zen book, the new Zen book. Okay. And then after that, uh, they had the ROG Ally, and everybody was just waiting to hear about yeah. the ROG Ally, and and even the guy who was giving the Zen book presentation was like, I know you guys want to hear about the ROG, Ally. <laughs> but they had them all laid around the the room, and you could just pick them up and play around with them and okay. mess around and stuff and it was pretty cool i mean i was really really hoping for a price because how am i supposed to give my thoughts on this right it's a super powerful windows gaming tablet uh obviously a competitor to the steam deck yeah uh and since it's windows you can do a lot more with it right that also means the ui will be significantly worse <laughs> asus tried really hard to make their own sort of uh ui and they, they they had a little bit of success with it right uh it is it, well i'm sure we'll get to it when we read through the article but uh yeah without the price i can't tell how it's gonna stack up yeah. I, I saw this thing it is it is packed with 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 hardware there is is very powerful right so i can't see this thing selling for less than like 1200 yeah i feel like the the way they've positioned it and like all the things all the way they've been talking about it this is definitely going to be a four figure machine so i'm with you yeah. but there was so i went with our friend Pasini. yes he came uh he over he's like i think i heard somebody talk about the price <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, what? Picturing him do, like spying on people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just looking over their yeah. shoulder hey, with a hey, microphone. So he he goes, I think I heard them talking about the price. Um, and the guy said uh, there's a very high chance, like an Asus representative said there's a very high chance that it will be under a uh, $1,000. Uh, uh, okay. um, and apparently that was reported on today. The oh. guy that that <laughs> guy told that to reported it. Reported it. So oh. it's confirmation that the CD wasn't just making <laughs> things up. The guy, I think the quote is there's a 200% chance that it will be under $1,000. Wow. Which I still don't believe. If because <sighs> there is a lot packed into this thing, then they would have to be selling this at a loss. And I don't see why they would do that because then how would they make up the cost? So they're not selling software. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, H3 Catacomb in the chat says, ETA Prime, other rumors are based... The, 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 the base model will be $650. Okay. That I saw from uh, a, a, a Korean Twitter account was talking about how the base model might be $650, which would be absolutely insane. Yeah. That would <laughs> position it very competitively against the steam deck mm -hmm. and it would be a very viable option in that regard yes but i still do not believe that yeah another reason i don't believe this is because they will not say the price mm -hmm. until may 11th which is the day the embargo for the reviews lift yes so usually companies will do that they'll hide information until the day the embargo lifts because they don't want you to consider it in the review. Yeah. So I think they're doing something nefarious. If if it does launch for six hundred and fifty dollars, my socks will be blown clean <laughs> off my feet. I mean, nefarious in a sense that a lot of people will hold because video game companies do this all the time. They'll hold back reviews. They'll put an embargo as close to, if not on release day, mm -hmm. because they're afraid that the bad press is going to prevent people from buying the yeah, game. Yeah. So, I mean, let's say, you know, the, the embargo for the price is on launch day and the, you know, people are waiting for it, but they can't pre-order it. And then it comes out, Oh, it's a thousand dollars. That's going to like cut, you know, it's going to hurt their sales. Yeah. Way. A lot of people are going to make reviews saying how great it is. Yeah. And then the price is going to drop and everyone's going to be like, well, I, I, it's I great, can't afford this. Like, yeah. It's great. But is it that great? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I I think that it is going on sale on May 11th yeah. also. So I think the re the embargo is until the day that it, it it's dropping on sale. Not the day it ships, Yeah, the day that you'll be able to purchase it. Another reason is because they're trying to make sure they nail down the 
pricing with their manufacturers and yeah. stuff. All the, they make sure that they can sell all of the components for that price. Mm-hmm. That's probably the real reason, but it's also a little bit that it could end up being very expensive. Yeah. So I'm gonna get this in like a week. I'm gonna I'm gonna have this in my hands okay. and I'll be able to mess around with it. And I will have a review on May 11th. I just am going to wait until the price is revealed. Yeah. And I'm gonna throw that. I'm gonna make the whole review, and then when the price is revealed, I will weave that into the, yeah. the video. Um, but again, there's a lot of tech packed into this thing that m- makes me question how cheap they can sell this thing for. Yeah. And if they do sell it for six hundred fifty dollars, you'll find out why my socks will be blown clean yeah. off. Go, go, go ahead. All right, I'll I'll just skip ahead to um. Third paragraph where they do talk about the components. I'm already going to stop you because this little thumbnail that that Engadget has. Yeah. It has that. Uh, oh, you know what? Never mind. It has the turbo button thing. Like, yeah. So, so there's different modes uh, that the, the 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 CPU and the fan can hit. Yeah. This laptop that we're streaming off of right now has that, too. It's an Asus laptop. Now yeah. I'm putting it all together. <laughs> There's a button that will go from like default to like performance and turbo mode. Right. That's why sometimes you'll hear the fans really right. kick up. It uh, for you Power Rangers fans, it shifts into turbo. Oh, it's a Power Rangers turbo reference. Oh, good it's lord, kids out there. All the right. the uh, the big deal about the Asus ROG Ally is that uh, the fans are super duper quiet. Yes, they are significantly quieter than the Steam Deck. Yeah, I watched Dave Two D do a video they talked to, actually i watched his engadget video and he said like he couldn't hear the fans at all even uh-huh. when he put it right up to his ear okay so uh so the components not only does it feature a ryzen zen 1 chip a new ryzen zen 1 chip which is a customized zen 4 rdna3 apu designed specifically for handheld gaming pcs it also has a 7 inch 1080p screen with 500 nits of brightness and a 112 hertz refresh rate that is insane 120 hertz in a handheld yeah doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, that alone represents a premium upgrades compared to the Steam Deck. And with Asus uh, claiming that the ROG Ally is between 50 and 100% more powerful than the, than the Steam Deck, depending on the power settings, it might have the performance necessary to make that screen really shine. With Asus rounding out the ROG Ally's kit with up to 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, and a micro SD card slot, there's very little to complain about it in terms of hardware uh the screen which might be the best looking display in this category colors were very bright and rich and didn't look washed out um on any game that was played which sometimes happens on the steam deck and even though the panel is the same size as the one you see on the steam deck uh the added resolution and the 120 hertz refresh rate made games look both sharper and more fluid yeah the screen was gorgeous yeah the screen was really uh, that's like the big takeaway from all these like the screen just like is in a league of its own it's really big yeah uh it's 1080p where the steam deck is 1200 by 800 yeah uh and it's 720p on the steam deck and the steam deck is 60 hertz uh but people in like the steam deck community have been playing games at 40 hertz because uh they just run better this one is 120. Yeah. I don't know what games you're going to be playing at 120 because yeah. that's going to be really bogging down that's the That's definitely a case of like just because the screen can do 120 doesn't mean that like the machine itself can do 120 consistently yeah. for every game. Yeah. I'm scrolling through my Twitter. There it is. I, I was trying to find this yeah. guy uh, took up the picture that I took of the ROG Ally. I forgot that I scheduled it to... to I scheduled my tweet to post the the second uh, the embargo was lifted, um, and it's just a picture of the game running Forza. Yeah, that that's like one of my go to games because first of all it's on Game Pass and yeah. I can just load it up really easily. But that's also just what was on the, these these devices. They had Forza running. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize it has the specs on it. It has the specs on the screen. Uh. It says CPU 21%, uh, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, 1,431 megahertz. So 1.4 gigahertz. GPU uh, 98%, 1.1 gigahertz. Uh, FPS 81. Damn. 
that's crazy. Yeah. I didn't was it I I didn't really notice. It just kind of just yeah. felt like 60 hertz. Also, I'm at a, like a convention setting. Battery 87%. It was like on and off the charger. Um 87% is actually pretty low. I'd imagine this thing's sucking up battery life. Yeah. Because this thing was on the charger right before I pulled <laughs> it off, so that shouldn't really be as low as it is. I also noticed it got hot very quickly. Really? It was very hot. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and maybe it was not the best environment. Yeah. I don't know. But all of the specs are telling me this thing's going to be a million dollars. Yeah. So... It it's a it's a great device, but not f- for a thousand dollars. Like yeah. I'd still suggest a Steam Deck over spending all of that money. Well, uh, the next paragraph, another big difference between the Ally and the Steam Deck is that the Ally runs Windows 11, which Asus says was a deliberate move to make sure gamers could play all of their favorite titles from any of the major stores: Steam, Epic, Battle.net, etc. On top of that, Asus added a new thoughtful uh, software tweaks, including a customized version of the Armory Crate app, uh, along with a helpful button for quickly toggling between hardware settings for stuff like power draw, performance modes, and more. And even on the preview devices, Asus hardware felt more responsive than similar apps on competitors like the iMeo 2. Yeah, so that is my biggest problem with uh, Windows handhelds right now yeah. is that there's the UI is horrible, mm-hmm. right? Right here, you can see the general Windows is just, it's just Windows. And yeah. you, you kind of need a mouse in order to navigate that. Yeah, it's not designed, it's, you know, not even designed for a seven inch screen. It's designed for like a 32 inch screen. Yeah, it yeah. really sucks trying yeah. to set up Windows on a small device like this. I, I tried it with a couple of under other Windows, yeah. uh, the Ioneo stuff, all of those. It's it's a horrible experience trying to set it up. You basically need to plug in a mouse and keyboard at some point. But Asus is a big company, yeah. they're a big player. They have, I mean, uh, Engadget kind of shows it here. They have what looks like a tile system. It looks kind of like Steam Big Picture mode. Uh, all of your games are there, all and and some of your apps, uh, and you can navigate it like you would on like a Nintendo Switch, like the yeah. Nintendo Switch home screen or something, and it works very well. It's from what I tried of it, it is very slow to like open up a game, yeah. but I mean, it is again like a super powerful Windows game, so you're gonna have to deal with load times like that. It's gonna be a little buggy. I opened up Steam. That's another thing. It's got all your games, but it also has like Steam. And if you click on Steam, it'll open Steam in big picture mode and it looks like the Steam Deck. Right. So that's kind of <laughs> sick. But on one of the ROG allies, I clicked on Steam and it just, it was just a blue screen. <laughs> so <laughs> not a like crash blue screen, but like a, like something was wrong. Right. Like, I, yeah. It didn't freeze the whole thing, but it yeah. wouldn't open Steam. Uh, so it's buggy and needs some work. I mean, right. they still got some time. Uh, maybe it was just a preview build. Yeah. I suspect it's Windows and nothing's hyper optimized. Nothing stable on Windows. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, that's another point in favor of a Steam Deck. Yeah. Like things are just going to be optimized and, and work better. Yeah. Than, like right out of the box. Um, but again, it's cool that you have the option to be able to play games that you can't play on the Steam Deck. Like Destiny doesn't. Yeah. I want to be able to play Destiny portably. That doesn't run on the on the Steam Deck at all. Um, other games that have anti cheats, uh, uh, games that don't that aren't on Steam, games yeah. that maybe uh, now I can play all my Game Pass. Yeah, games. Game Pass games, games that are exclusive to the Epic Store. Uh, yeah, Fortnite. Yeah, so. If you're subscribed to the Ubisoft Plus subscription where you get all your Ubisoft games because you really <laughs> want to play the same game 20 times in a row, the this will be it for you. Yeah. Uh, Skinny Jamaican says Warzone. Yeah, stuff on Battle.net. Yeah. Like all, all that. It, it opens up your library a lot more. Uh, but you're going to have to deal with a little bit of wonkiness. Yeah. Uh, that Again, that was my biggest concern was... Are they going to have some sort of UI or something? Yeah. And also to note, did we we might have talked about this last week. Um, there was an internal uh, pitch at Microsoft that they had like a game jam type of thing. Yeah. And 
some one of the developers at Microsoft was pitching making a UI for Windows specifically for Windows handhelds, like the S- Steam Deck. Yeah. So Microsoft might actually be working on something like this. I would imagine like they see the the tide of the industry because like this might be the biggest one to come out so far, like PC gaming handheld. But this has been happening for like a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. So it would behoove them and look how fast they, you know, try to add support to the steam deck. Yeah. Like they're, they understand the way the industry is moving. And if, you know, they're not going to make a handheld themselves, at least what they can do is create a version of windows that can run on a handheld and is optimized for a handheld. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how much they'd want to allocate, like how much time and effort they want to allocate to do something like that. Yeah. I mean, I th- it would be worth it for us, of course. Yeah. But how worth it would it be for Microsoft? I mean, no, it would it would totally be worth it because they're yeah. making all of these devices. Yeah. These devices are licensing Windows yeah. and stuff. You it, know, like it doesn't Microsoft doesn't necessarily make computers, but like yeah. other companies make computers and they all use Windows, so it'd be a similar boat. That's where my head's at because yeah. uh, I want Xbox to make a handheld so badly, right? And like if they're not going to make the handheld why would they spend time working on the dev side but then yeah. again like that's the whole point of microsoft is that yeah, they're, they're a, a software, software company. company so they make the software work and then other people will make the handhelds and then boom you got a xbox handheld yeah my i did you all take that journey with me <laughs> <laughs> all right is there anything else here um for those who want beefier performance, I'm going to skip because it, you know, the face buttons and the shoulder buttons is the same as every other. It's literally yeah. the same as everything. Uh, People are upset about the D-pad. It has the Xbox. The circle D-pad. Yeah, it has yeah. the Xbox series style circle D-pad. And it's fine. It also it's only fine. has two back buttons instead of four. Yeah. Which. I'm not upset about that. Yeah. I, I rarely use the back buttons anyway. Uh, the Steam Deck has four. I never use them on the Steam Deck. Uh, I only use two on the uh, Elite controller. So I I'm think, totally fine. I think it's one of those things where like people just see less, they automatically assume worse. Yeah. But I think I think like you said, two it will be probably be more than enough. The triggers aren't that great. Yeah. I didn't I didn't love the triggers. Uh I hate I hate the the font on the on the <laughs> A B X Y buttons. I, yeah. I, I hate that. Um generally it's not the best looking. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's a little bit more sleek than the Steam Deck is, but I don't know if necessarily that's the right way to go. It was extremely comfortable. Yeah, it was very comfortable. Right, but so was the com- Steam Deck. Yeah. The Steam Deck's pretty comfortable. So, uh, for those who want beefier performance, Asus uh, included an XG mobile port, so you can hook up the ROG Ally up to one of the company's portable GPU docks. Admittedly. Uh, the writer is not sure they see the need to take a handheld PC and tether it to a big dock, even if it does provide better performance. And with the cheapest XG mobile dock going for about $1,000 mm. uh, for an older 30 series card, it's a pricey way to upgrade Ally's performance. But for people who might already have one of the Asus Flow series gaming laptops, it's a nice bit of extra value. All told, the only thing you really don't get on the Ally are built-in touchpads like the Steam Deck or a second USB-C jack like the Ioneo 2. And while Asus has opted for standard analog control sticks instead of the ones based on the more sophisticated magnetic Hall effect sensors, the company teased that it may be possible to swap in third-party joysticks in the future. Did, did they wait? Did they say that there's not an extra USB-C? Because I thought there was. Uh, they said there is an. Uh, f- no, I guess not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm looking at the top now. So, yeah, they have this very strange proprietary port Yeah. that allows for an external GPU, and that I got to play around with. Okay. I, I, I I found it just sitting in a corner. Yeah. Like, it, like, like <laughs> I was sitting on a couch, like, watching this boring yeah. presentation, and next to me was that, was yeah. the, the, the black rectangle, and I just went... I just picked it up and started like messing around with yeah, it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is the GPU. Yeah. Suddenly I'm holding $2,000, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, it connects to the top in this weird looking port it, that 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 has 
a USB C and then what looks like a long SATA port. Yeah, it's very this strange. Is, like the article said, it introduced this in like their Flow series of laptops, where like it's literally just an external GPU that you plug in to like to yeah. get more power. But it's a proprietary port. Yeah, you know, which I guess means it works better than just any random generic USB C yeah. port. But at the same time, because it's proprietary and because it's so expensive, I don't see that getting a lot of usage from a lot of people. Whereas, you know, the Switch comes with a dock, so you could just hook it up to a TV yourself. And the Steam Deck just uses a regular ass USB C port, so you can plug in any hub or any dongle into it, and it just plugs in. Yeah, this is something that was developed already. Yeah. So, like, that's why it's not a dock. That's yeah. why it's not just something specifically for the uh, Asus ROG Ally. Yeah. Uh, it was for the laptops that they had previously. And and it's it's a cool idea, but you're right. The fact that it's proprietary uh, makes it a harder sell. I, I, I talked to the guy, and uh -huh. he said that the reason it's a proprietary port is because there's a, a less overhead. It, 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 it just means uh, it's faster, and you can right. get more uh, uh power from the gpu into the device quicker than right. you would over regular USB C or even thunderbolt which is crazy to me because yeah. i thought thunderbolt was already insanely fast yeah because there are thunderbolt gpus yeah. out there and you know i guess this is less about like connecting it to a tv and more about just getting like more raw raw horsepower yeah out of the device but at the same time I think we've all reached the point where, like, we understand that we're not buying handhelds for horsepower. We're buying them for convenience factor. Yeah. So it just seems like unnecessary overkill. It's going to be like that port on the first uh, iteration of the PlayStation Vita. It had an expansion port, and nobody knew what it did. And by the second iteration, they just got rid of it. Well, I will say this, though. Uh, the Steam Deck has USB-C. Right. So you can plug that into an external display. You can even you use... Well, no, you can't. You can't use an external GPU. There are people who did external GPUs on a Steam Deck through its uh through its like like SSD port. Like okay. they opened it up and and, right. and that's how they got the external GPU to work. Not worth it. Yeah. I will say you can still use the USB C port to dock it to put it on an external display or whatever yeah they just took something that already existed and put it in here it's just an added feature they didn't have to do that you know right. so you could still do all of the general USB C stuff so i don't want to dock points for that you know yeah. it's something that existed already they just put it in here i'll also say if i was like 17 i would be all i would i would have oh yeah <clears throat> ate up this marketing i would have oh, yeah. been like mom dad my college computer is an ROG yeah. ally, <laughs> and I would have gotten the dock, and I would have hooked it up at home and played all my games at home, yeah. and I would have undocked it and you know gone to school. Oh, absolutely. And they would have said, no, you're getting the cheapest MacBook that exists. Yeah. And I'd be like, fuck Bye. you, mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did, back then, uh, I, I think the first laptop I bought with my, my hard-earned money was... Uh, uh, Microsoft Surface Pro 2. Yeah. Which was a terrible, terrible <laughs> laptop. But I loved the idea of the versatility of that laptop. Yeah. So I, it, this kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. That's why I like stuff like the Switch. Like, I can do all this crazy yeah. shit with it. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I, I also played with this while it was docked. Like, I, they had a setup that was docked. And yeah. I played it. And honestly, it just felt so, like I was playing a computer. So I was going to ask, so like, while it was hooked up to the, the GPU, were you playing it as a handheld or were you playing it on like a no, screen? No, I played on a, uh, I played on a screen using their new controller they have coming out. They oh, have, that's right. They yeah, have yeah. the controller with the screen. Yeah. I used that. And that was pretty cool. It kind of just felt like an Xbox controller. Right. Um, They, I was playing Ghost Runner, which is okay. not really a game to showcase like high yeah. GPU settings also i was so bad at the game and they were making fun of me oh wow <laughs> and i was like they were making fun of me and then i said the worst part about this guys is that i've played this game before <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i guess that's the rog ally i mean i don't think the battery life is gonna be that great it 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 
can't be any better than a Steam Deck. Yeah, it, it, um, the article does end with uh, saying the point of concern is if the 40, out, 40 watt battery can deliver a decent longevity while still pumping out strong performance. That sounds low. Yeah. Uh, yeah, significantly low. Uh, the Steam Deck already has a horrible battery life. Yeah. I got, I think, Sonic Frontiers running for an hour. Wow. <laughs> it's bad. Um, so, yeah, I don't think the battery life's going to be that great. I'm still really skeptical about the price. Even, yeah. wait, uh, the the end gadget guy is expecting at least eight hundred dollars. Yeah, I don't know, man. I it, mean, I, I with all of this tech, I'm expecting over a grand. But there's rumors saying six fifty, which would be insane. insane. That would be an insane price point, yeah. and that would put them in stark competition yeah. with Steam. I don't know. I I feel like this is definitely trying to be like like the luxury version of the steam deck mm -hmm. like maybe they're trying to like asus is trying to position the steam deck as like you know more the common man uh game uh gaming system like that's a toyota this is a lexus <laughs> you want to ride in a lexus if they were going to do that they got to make it a lot sleeker looking because this thing looks like it, it, it looks, looks like hell <laughs> it looks like i mean to me it looks like you know someone wrote gamer pc gamer handheld on a whiteboard yeah <laughs> they tried to design it around that they typed pc gamer handheld into chat uh gpt or, yeah. or, or an image generator and they got this yeah also at the event they had uh rgb lighting all over the room it was yeah. really lame <laughs> like you can see you can see the guy that's the corner i sat in yeah and yeah you see all the stupid rgb lights yeah that's gonna be like ten years from now when they're making period pieces. Of, oh yeah, of of the tw of the twenty twenties. It's gonna be. It's gonna be so much RGB lighting. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I gotta explain that to my kids. <laughs> you see, back in the back in the day, <laughs> there, were, there, there were, were these lights that were all the yes. colors of the rainbow, and it made your computers go faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how we got the ladies. They knew. Oh, yes. this guy must have a cool computer. <laughs> this guy must have spent a lot of money on that thing. Anyway, yeah, I am only excited about this if it, if the price points on point, but I'm yeah. very skeptical, and I'll let you know in about two weeks. Anyway, we did get a notification from Juan Decimo with 18 months. Hello, fellas! Another month, another live tweet of the week request. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> I forgot the tweet of the week. Oh no, this show is falling apart. Uh, what about Zoidberg? In the chat. It yeah. says, the touchpads are amazing. One of my favorite features. That's another thing. This is noticeably missing touchpads. I got to be honest with you. I hope the next Steam Deck doesn't have touchpads. All the like similar devices are missing touchpads. Yeah. I don't see the purpose of the touch. Like, I, like I understand why they, they put touchpads there. I don't think anybody uses the touchpads. Except for what about Zoidberg, apparently. Of course, yes. Uh, <laughs> like, I know that there's games that you can't use with a controller and you yeah. need the touchpads, but I don't think they work good in those games either. Yeah, I know. I feel like that's a holdover from the Steam controller because they tried to make the, the analog sticks touchpads because they were still of the mindset that, like, a lot of PC games were designed for mouse and keyboard only, like yeah. RTSs and strategy games and point-and-click adventures, so they need, like, something comparable to that. And they carry that over to Steam Deck, but as we see, none of its competitors have the same features. Yeah. So, you know, if if the Steam Deck Two has them, then you know Valve's like putting their planting their feet in the dirt, saying like, "No, it needs it." And if it doesn't, they're just like, "Hey, everybody's right." Yeah, I I mean, they got to make a new Steam Deck eventually. Yeah. They're yeah. gonna take a while, but they got to make one eventually. Yeah. I. Don't understand how Valve works internally. I watched that whole documentary and I yeah. still don't understand. It's amazing anything gets done. I there know. Because they don't have any sort of like traditional structure. They just kind of, whatever you feel like working you on, go ahead. Whatever you want, man. Yeah. So. And you mean to tell me not a single fucking person there is working on Half-Life 3? <laughs> I know. Not a single person there was like, I'm going to take it upon myself to do this. Yeah. No. No. Not, not, a, not a one of them. Does um I don't think it said it in the article the, the ally is a touchscreen right yeah okay yeah I I because I tapped 
Yeah. Uh, the the steam button and nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. I guess we'll just dive right into the indie world showcase that happened yes. last week. This was uh, on April nineteenth, which yes. was last Wednesday. We just missed it. Mm-hmm. A bunch of games announced. Bunch of games. Uh, are you excited for any of them? Because I kind of no. was not. <laughs> there was so. I always try to say you, you can't be disappointed about an indie world because right. they're indie games. They're little games. They're, they're low budget yeah. games. You, they're, it's amazing Nintendo's even putting a focus on them at all. Yeah. But I just went to PAX and played a bunch of indie yeah. games. A lot of great stuff. I played a lot more great things than what I'm seeing here. Yeah. I feel like they could have picked a lot of better stuff right. for this. I'm sure these, you know what it is? I the, None of these are just my my right speed, yeah really first one's mineko's night market uh an old japanese cool. inspired village at the center of mount fugu is visited upon by miko a cat like god miko visits the farms of this village each year to grant uh, good fortune and prosperity to the farmers however some farmers grow impatient with their blessings and drive miko out with miko banished from the lands this village works hard to create its own success and as time goes on fewer and fewer people believe in the myth of miko but still, some still do, and it sounds like we'll learn more about what that means for some of the characters throughout their journey. In the game, you'll befriend townsfolk, craft doodads, and ultimately prepare for the weekly night market. The quiet village becomes a bustling hub of commerce, parades, cat races, and strange and stage performances. And when you're exploring the island, everything you find can be brought back and sold on the market. Uh, coming to Switch and PC September 26th. Cat doodads. Yeah. Uh, craft doodads craft doodad there's a lot of cat games yeah maybe that's why i didn't yeah. like this we need more dog games remember dogs do you remember dogs, dogs? Are awesome dogs are great we like dogs yes i got a great video of zim today i got sh- I, got, I was gonna t- put it in the family group chat yeah uh there was a there was a rabbit outside oh boy and i opened the door for him to go chase the rabbit and he ran outside the rabbit ran away and he immediately just started peeing <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Zim. Yep. All right. My time at Sand Rock uh, is a new town sim set in the same world as 2019's My Time at Porsche. Um, but gone are the luscious greens and countryside settings of that game. And this place is a new post apocalyptic desert community hoping to restore to its former glory. Um, it will feature dozens of characters to interact with and plenty of side quests to keep your schedule in Sand Rock busy. Uh, it first launched in Steam Early Access last May and hits the Switch this summer. If you purchase the main game, a separate online multiplayer version will be available after launch for, so you and your friends can play together in Sand Rock. That's so annoying. Yeah. The, the, the launch first launched on Steam Early Access. That's going to happen a lot. Yeah. And it makes you feel like you're missing out if you <laughs> don't have a Steam Deck or, yeah. or, or some way, some other way to play these games because, again... You're just sitting around waiting, waiting for the thing to release for the device that you want to play it on. Yeah. Uh, next is Played Up, a roguelite management sim where your goal is to create, decorate, manage, and ultimately automate a restaurant. You'll need to manage both the kitchen and the front of the house to keep customers happy. At each end of the randomly generated shift, you can purchase new appliances and other upgrades to increase the efficiency of your business. Plus, you can play with up to three friends in local or online co-op. It arrives on the Switch this October. Jackson's all about this game. It just seems like uh, uh, overcooked, but this is roguelite? Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. And also, apparently, this has Twitch integration. Like your Twitch chat can be like the people dining in your in your restaurant. Oh, that's so cool. that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's cool. Anyway. I feel like that can get like very chaotic and random, like, but like for all the wrong reasons. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, next is Quilts and Cats of Calico. Cat game. Wait, cat hold game. on. We got. We need a cat, cat game, game counter. counter. We that's have two. two. Okay, we're on two. Uh, is a video game adaptation of the popular tabletop game Calico. Much like the board game, you'll need to place tile pieces on a board, sew patterns to score points, and more in an effort to attract cats to your quilt. In this version of Calico, you can customize your cats, changing how their fur looks and adding cosmetics as well. Comes to the Switch this fall. Uh, next one is a cool looking one. Yes, Rift. Rift of the Necro Dancer. I'll be honest, this looks rad as hell. Yeah. 
Uh, it is a spinoff of Crypt of the Necrodancer with an all new storyline that takes place in the world of Crypt and applies it to musical lane based combat system. You'll need to match the on screen prompts barreling down the lanes in order to defeat enemies. Each monster type uh, has a different movement pattern and uh, some, some even take multiple hits to defeat. Boss battles will bring additional challenges to the songs too. But if you're looking for something else outside of the main storyline, Rift of the Necro Dancer features a special mini game to play for each of the five character storylines in the game coming to Switch and PC this year. There's cool looking mini games too. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to bring it up on screen right now because so that's not the trailer that they showed. The one that I just had up. That, that was the one that the was one. on the I don't and gadget uh game informer doesn't have. They don't have they, they don't have videos. Yeah. There was a some very suggestive, very suggestive animations. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> look, look at this. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I want to see the suggestion. Okay. Oh yeah, I get. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you yeah, how you feel? Yeah. You you get that? Okay. You get it? Yeah. And it doesn't stop. It nope, just doesn't nope. stop. All right. You know what? That's <laughs> rock and roll, baby. Rock and roll, baby. And then they, I think they cut back to it later. Yeah. So they read. Did the trailer, I think? <laughs> yes, try and cut the suggestion out, but too late. I don't know. That uh, looks fun. It like, looks cool, though. It looks, yeah. like a, it looks really cool. Looks like I'm interested game. in the mini games. It looks kind of like uh, yeah. Elite Beat Agent or, yeah. or Rhythm Heaven or, or something like that. Uh, anyway, the next one is A Little to the Left, Cupboards and Drawers. This counts as a cat game. Yeah. There's a cat in it. Yeah. Uh, this is a DLC for a little bit to the left, which launches on the Switch in June, and it brings 25 new pu puzzles to tidy up as you explore the world of small spaces, secret compartments, and more. If you like uh, rearranging the stuff that's in your desk drawers, this is the game for you. <laughs> Next was Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon Puzzlers Pack DLC. The free Puzzler Pack DLC for Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon launches this spring. It's just, it's just DLC for Pocket Dungeon. Yeah, which... It is a good thing. Uh, it's it's a it's a good game. Yeah. I I think it you could I, it was on Apple Arcade. I think. Yeah, I think so. I don't I don't know. My I always let my subscription lapse every time I get the free trials. Mm. Yeah. So I was in I was watching this uh, Indie World live, uh -huh. and uh, I was looking at the chat, and the chat was just spamming clown emojis because they just hate Nintendo. They're just yeah. being like, "Oh, this is an L. This is stupid." Yeah. Until Cult of the Lamb showed up, and then everybody went nuts. <laughs> Uh, Cult of the Lamb, Relics of the Old Faith, upcoming uh, expansion for Cult of the Lamb. You'll come across dozens of new items, relics, and enemies. Plus, this DLC features new versions of the four Guardian Bishops, uh, new buildings to construct, and additional followers to recruit. You can keep the faith going into in a new Permadeath Gauntlet run mode and a boss, ru boss Rush mode after beating the game 2 launches April 24th, yesterday. Oh. This game's really good. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I, I kind of fell off of it. Uh, the best part about this game was the Twitch integration, how you can have uh, yeah. your Twitch chat in, like, the friggin' the, your cult, basically. Yeah. Uh, but it was great. There was a good, like, roguelike. Uh, is it roguelike? Kind of roguelike. Yeah. Rogue light. I don't know. It was good. Anyway, next game's Animal Well. That was cool because Donkey showed up on screen. Yeah. And once Donkey was there, the chat was also like, going. Ah! Yeah. yeah. I remember. Uh, in Animal Well, you'll explore an atmospheric, pixelated world in search of treasures within a labyrinth environment. Uh, items you pick up can be used in a number of ways, like a quick getaway or to have a friendly animal help you. You'll need to get crafty with items to survive in Animal Well, which hits the switch in winter. So this game looks really pretty. Um, I don't understand how you play it. I think you just kind of run away from things. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's a platformer, but yeah. I don't know like what the general game mechanics are yeah. really. It's so. it's weird watching Donkey talk, like actually see him talk because like mm -hmm. that's how he talks. Yeah. I always just assume he was putting on a character, but no, no, that's, no. That, that's 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 how he him. talks. Uh, which is the opposite of like sometimes when I watch a movie and like the actor like has like talks a certain way and then I see him in interviews and he doesn't sound like that at all and I get mad. <laughs> British. Yeah. Well, British when British actors are speaking English, there's are there, speaking English. Yeah. When British <laughs> actors are talking with an American accent in their movies. Well, uh, there's one actor on Ted Lasso who like talks with a very gruff voice and then in interviews he's got a very like pleasant sounding voice. I was like, what? That's not him. 
<laughs> That's not Roy oh, Kent. God. Uh, um, this next game, the logo looks like Crime Cock. I will say, Crime O'Clock is a good name for a game. Yes. <laughs> I just don't know if it's right for this kind of game. Uh, in this unique puzzle exploration game that looks inspired by Where's Waldo, uh, you'll have more than 40 cases to solve across time and space. Uh, there are... Yep. Crime Cock. Crime Cock. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name for a different kind of game. Uh, there are many eras to visit uh, from the lost a- lost age to the cybernetic future and different crime scenes develop across various timelines. What you solve in one timeline could affect another and the map changes as you play through the game. Um, it launches June 30th. This game doesn't seem interesting. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's got a good premise. Uh, it's got a great name, Crime Cock. It does, <laughs> it I wish I wish it was a little bit different than like yeah. what, what it is, you know? Yeah. Uh, next one is Tesla Grad, which looks kind of cool. Looks like it's, yeah. it's it's up my it's up my alley. Apparently, there was a Tesla Grad one. This is Tesla Grad two, and both of them came to the Switch. Uh, I think the day this was announced uh, yeah tesla grad 2 available today alongside tesla grad remastered a modernized re-release of the first game that features enhanced individuals and 10 extra challenge levels uh pick up both in the power pack edition or purchase each game individually it is a physics-based puzzle platformer i guess uh yeah yeah physics-based puzzles as you explore seamless scandinavian environments it seems like a 2d yeah. platformer though so i don't know it, it that that seems a little interesting Next is Shadows Over Loathing, which is the sequel to West of Loathing. Yeah. Uh, new slapstick comedy game set in the world of West of Loathing. It features plenty of stick figures, uh, flappers, fishermen, fishmen, goblins, government conspiracies, and more in a unique 1920 setting. You'll encounter talking frogs, sentient math, in uh, eldritch horrors in the black and white world. And the digital version is out today. But if you want a physical version, uh, you'll have to wait till the fall. I've always, I like the art style of these games. And I like the... Stick figures. Yeah. <laughs> And the like the sensibility of them. I just don't know if like they're the type of games I would actually want to play. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I understand. Uh the next one is the one I guess I'm most excited about in this. Uh Blasphemous. Blasphemous two. So I never played the first Blasphemous. I almost did. Yeah. And then I saw a review of it and I kind of guessed I wouldn't like it that much. <laughs> uh, but I kind of regret not playing it. Right. And this looks like it's more my speed because there looks like there's actual platforming in it too. So, uh, sequel to Blasphemous, this game remains faithful to the original skill-based combat and challenging platforming, but it comes with improved visuals and additional abilities to help you survive. Features progressive uh, progression system, custom builds, and an expanded player moveset launches in the summer. So Blasphemous is like a 2D Souls-like, basically. Yes. So it looks really good. Yeah. I'm definitely going to play that when it comes out. The big deal game that they had was Oxen Free 2. That this was a one more thing from a previous indie world. Yeah. And they made a big deal about it in this one too. Uh set five years after the first Oxen Free. Um Oxen Free 2 follows Riley as she returns to her hometown of Kamina to investigate some strange electromagnetic waves. Just uh four hours ago, a mysterious cult opened a portal above Edwards Island, and Riley and her friends aren't sure they're the ones that need to be saved. Oh, sorry. Riley and her friends aren't sure. They're the ones that need to save the island, but they know they have to. The trailer seems to indicate we'll be playing with a different timeline, spooky ghosts from other side, uh, and more, and we'll be doing so with a special radio. We'll also, this time, have a walkie-talkie to interact with locals and learn about what might be going on coming uh, to Switch and PC and PlayStation uh, July 12th. I don't know if you noticed, but like the trailer opened with Netflix Game Studios. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, all the things I've been saying on this podcast about Netflix, like, being really fucking serious about getting into gaming, like, this is it. Yeah. No, I was I was surprised so. when I saw that. I, but then I was like, I, I was like, oh, I should have known about this. Didn't we know that Netflix bought this game or something? Or I think, studio? I mean, we knew Netflix was, like, buying studios. I don't know if yeah. we, like, necessarily knew they bought Oxenfree, mm-hmm. but this was that reminder. You forget. You forget, but here they are. They think you think they're just canceling your favorite shows, but we're gonna see that a lot more. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's acts. It's it's published by Netflix, right? And but because they WM Interactive, because I think they bought the developer of Oxenfree Night School Studio. Yes. yes. 
Uh, parent organization Netflix. Yeah. Wow. And uh, the sizzle reel. They did a sizzle reel after this. They didn't even do a one more thing. No, they just, just they, they just did yeah. a sizzle reel and a lot of big stuff in the sizzle reel. Yeah. So you have Five Nights at Freddy's uh, security breach available now. Uh, Bomb Rush Cyberfuck has, has a release date of August 18th. So that has a a release date. Yeah, that's a big, a big deal. deal people are waiting for this game. And, and when I saw it in the indie world, when it was live, yeah, uh, Twitter exploded with news outlets dropping the release date. Yeah. So like that was a big deal. Why yeah. do they relegate it to a sizzle reel? I don't know. I I think maybe uh, maybe they didn't pay Nintendo enough. To like be when this is a real so maybe we, like I did hear from uh Liam, the Curse to Golf developer, that you actually they just don't tell you if you're gonna be in a scissor uh, world. So they just kinda say, Yeah, you're gonna be in the indie world. And then they just don't tell you in what we're they're they like get us a trailer, basically. Yeah. And then they just don't tell you. Maybe they didn't like the trailer that they got. Maybe, maybe. I, I, I don't. I don't know. know. But then like I saw the trailer afterwards, like the full trailer they released, and it looked good. Oh, I gotta watch it. Yeah. But yeah, we got a release date for it. Um, also, Paper Trail launching August 5th. Uh, Little Kitty, Big City sometime in 2024. Is that three? What? Is that, is yeah, that it's the uh, four. The, four? Because okay. the one game was technically a cat game. Right? The yes. The one where you put things in drawers? Yes. All four. Right. We're on four All cat right. games. Uh, Little Kitty, Big City, Chance of Sonar launching September 5th. Uh, Brotato uh, sometime this year. And Escape Academy Complete Edition coming in fall. Yeah. And then they didn't do one more thing, and that was the end of it. Yeah. So kind of a little disappointing, this indie world. Uh, not yeah. gonna lie. There was a lot of stuff that uh they could have added that would have been cool to see, but they just they just didn't. Yeah, I don't know. I mean Maybe it's because I already know about Rift of the Necro Dancer. Maybe do you think the Switch is no longer the indie haven it once was? That could be part of it. It's part of it could be because uh, I'm jaded that there's a lot of great indie stuff on the Steam Deck yeah. that, that I'm just assuming is coming to the Switch, but like I don't have any hard information. Right. But I really just think it's that I know that there's a lot of indie stuff out there, and and they they didn't pick a lot of my favorites. They picked right. a, a lot of weird stuff. Well, I think well when a lot of people think of indie games, they think of like the weird stuff. Mm-hmm. so i think that's what they're that's the cool shit we, we yeah. want the weird stuff yeah the, we want the weird stuff but at the same time you also want like some more like you know pop you know not pop culture like pop music type stuff like things that like everybody can be interested in you know i think that the biggest tell that this was a subpar indie world was that bomb rush cyber funk was in the sizzle reel yeah like uh, that should have that should have been front and center yeah. getting getting a release date for that so Whatever, man. I'm sure there's some stuff in there for everybody, yeah. though. It's it's a it's a Nintendo announcement. There's always a game for everybody, yeah. right? Yeah, like you'll find something in there. Obviously, Blasphemous Two was kind of a Blasphemous good deal. Two looked cool. Um, Rift of the Necro Dancer looked cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Something for everyone. Something for everyone. Next, we're gonna talk about. Uh, recent Xbox exclusives didn't sell well. Yes. Despite rave reviews. Oh, boy. Uh, f- all right. I'll do the original story, and then I'll go back to the update. You can they read put- the tweets, maybe. Uh, do, do, whatever, do whatever you want. Just get to the original story. Uh, Tango Gameworks exclusive Hi-Fi Rush didn't sell particularly well in spite of its immense critical reception. According to a well-known industry insider, this rare bit of granular insight into the commercial performance of a Bethesda-published game uh, goes against the fairly widespread view that Hi-Fi Rush was a major success. I played this today. Yeah? Yeah. I thought you played it before. I've played it before, and I played it more today today. (laughs) because I'm doing a video on Xbox. Right. Uh, Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo developer released its latest title on January 25th out of the blue. The decision to shadow drop Hi-Fi Rush during the Xbox and Bethesda Developer Direct uh, broadcast generated quite a bit of buzz, not least because games that gather rave reviews rarely arrive out of nowhere. Yet the positive publicity might have come at the expense of underwhelming sales, according to reporter Jeff Grubb. 
Uh, speaking during the April 20th episode of his podcast, the established industry insider said Hi-Fi Rush didn't make the money it needed to make, citing an unnamed sources. Grubb speculated that this lackluster performance could be attributed to the fact that Hi-Fi Rush was available on Game Pass from day one. Uh, though the launch itself was unexpected, the game's immense addition to the subscription service was a given as Tango Gameworks is owned by Microsoft's subsidiary uh, ZeniMax Media. While the Insider account did not go into any more details concerning the commercial performance of Hi-Fi Rush, the claim of lackluster sales does suggest that the game's publisher might be reluctant to try surprise releases in the future. Uh, for context, it was Bethesda's idea to shadow job Hi-Fi Rush. Um, given the state of affairs, the success of Hi-Fi Rush or lack thereof will necessarily result in any main ch major changes for Xbox Game Studios. Uh, this is part because Microsoft has a fairly hands-off approach to how it manages developers, so the subsidiaries don't really have a unified publishing strategy that's detailed enough to provide a rule book for things like surprise releases. Secondly, Xbox already teased more surprises in the vein of GoldenEye and Hi-Fi Rush um, that are planned for the second half of the year. That notwithstanding, this newly surfaced insider account further underlines how Game Pass can cannibalize game sales. Microsoft itself recently admitted as much during its ongoing back and forth with regulators over the pending Activision Blizzard acquisition. Yet the company also insists that day one Xbox Game Pass launches don't necessarily lead to lower revenue for third-party publishers. Besides various forms of monetary compensation, Microsoft previously argued that Game Pass also offers increased visibility to its partners, which can potentially result in more long-term sales. I'm so. I'm surprised at the narrative of this article because like, yeah. first of all, Hi-Fi Rush is an incredible game. Right. Uh, second of all, Microsoft owns Bethesda. Yeah. The company that published this game or, or, or Tango Gameworks. Tango Gameworks, which is owned by D Bethesda. Which is owned by Microsoft. Microsoft. Um, so Microsoft owns all of it. Yeah. So the fact that the game didn't sell well because it was pushed onto Game Pass day one, shouldn't that shouldn't downloads from Game Pass be important? Like it like that that is not a sale. So that will hurt sales, of yeah. course. But it should help Game Pass subscriptions. Like what if that day subscription numbers went up? Yeah. Like why aren't we thinking about that? Well, in response to this, uh, Microsoft's Aaron, Aaron Greenberg had stated, Hi-Fi Rush was a breakout hit for us and our players in all key measurements and expectations. We couldn't be happier with what the team at Tango Gameworks delivered with the surprise release. In response to that, Jeff Grubb clarified that he doesn't know how Microsoft measures success and that he was just trying to say that Hi-Fi Rush didn't make the money it was expected to make. Well, he said money it needed to make, which yeah. is what is very confusing. Like, Well, I, I'm assuming like all games need to make a profit of some kind. Yeah. And they have like a number that they have to hit in order for it to be successful. Right. So I'm assuming, you know, they're not getting money from Game Pass or they're not getting as much money as they would have from a direct sale. So... You know, somebody who doesn't have... I, I think it's... Hi-Fi Rush is Series X and S exclusive. It's not on Xbox One. No, but it is on PC. It is on PC. Yeah. So, well, it's not on Xbox One, so I can't play it. Yeah. So, but even if I had a gaming PC or an Xbox Series, that's $40 that I didn't put down. So, that's a sale right there they didn't have. You know, I'm... Sh you know how many people how many people have Game Pass that actually played this game, and how many people that don't have Game Pass bought this game? That's that's the question here. We're trying to figure out. Well, yeah, I mean Jeff Grubb says he doesn't know how Microsoft measures success. I'm assuming that the subscription is enough. Getting people to subscribe is what their focus is. Their focus. <sighs> clearly isn't on sales for a game like this their focus is getting people to engagement and like, yeah, yeah. To, to engage and and play game pass and, yeah and, and get the subscription because the thing is you buy a game once this game is 30 dollars. yeah you buy the game once for 30 dollars, or you get game pass for 15 dollars for the month 
and you forget that you have Game Pass <laughs> for a whole year. Yeah. And then you give them your whole year's worth of money. That's what they're hoping for. Yeah. They want those subscription numbers. We're we're entering a stage where like now Microsoft is like kind of using something similar to like the weird Netflix strategy for what determines the success. Because even people who make shows and movies for Netflix do not know what the metric is for it being a success. Mm -hmm. There are many stories of uh, shows that the creators were told, oh, this is successful. And then the next week, we're canceling your show wasn't successful enough. <laughs> yeah. The of, thing that comes into my mind is the, um, Netflix had a the Babysitter's Club adaptation. It was like a couple of seasons. And it was very successful with a very particular demographic middle school girls obviously but it wasn't making stranger things numbers and nothing makes stranger things numbers right. so they just canceled it because it's not making stranger things numbers so that that's the, and like they it's this weird like we know what is a success and we're not telling you but yeah. you have to make the show a success that's that's like the it, the age we're entering now with things like game pass and possibly even playstation now you know we're not going to tell you what makes a hit, but you have to make it a hit. What's interesting is Aaron Greenberg was responding to somebody else who mm. asked what exactly determines success for Xbox games these days. Mm. And then Aaron Greenberg said that Hi-Fi Rush was a success. Yeah. But didn't go into any more detail about what makes Xbox games a success. It doesn't help that like Microsoft doesn't really release sales data anymore. Mm -hmm. They haven't released how... like how many systems, how many Xbox systems they sold since the Xbox one. They're still not doing that. I don't even think they necessarily do it for games anymore. Like we have to rely on MPD group and like third parties to figure that out. So forget about finding out how many like downloads hi-fi rush got, Yeah, you know, since it launched. Uh, and I think that sucks because, you know, not only would it be good for consumers to know, cause people are curious about that, but it would be good for like the developers and publishers to know so that they're not afraid to put their games on Game Pass. Yeah, I'm curious. I know that developers are a little afraid to put games. I mean, it depends. Like some games will only do good if it gets picked up by a publisher. You yeah. know, like, like like some games are small and unknown enough that getting a big chunk of money to be put on Game Pass is worth it for them. Yeah. Um, but. Some games are going to think like, hey, we can make this money on our own if we just sell the games and, instead of putting it on your subscription service. So having numbers and being more transparent would be very helpful. I'm curious because uh, Metroid Prime Remastered also shadow dropped. Mm -hmm. It was launched on the same day it was announced. I'm curious because I don't know what the sales figures for that is, but I'm wondering because Hi-Fi Rush is a new IP. Yeah. And like they said, oh, there's something new and you can play it now. And it turned out to be a great game. Metroid Prime is already one of the greatest games of all time. Yeah. And they shadow dropped that. I'm wondering if, you know, that impacted its sales because it's Metroid Prime. It's, like I said, one of the greatest games of all time. People have been wanting to play it again for 20 years. Now's your chance. So, uh, Next, we're talking about Sony is quietly raising prices on its games on steam in certain regions reset era chairmaster chuck spotted the price of increase for ps4 and ps5 on steam database uh affecting several regions including argentina canada chile china colombia japan and south korea the games have been affected by inflation uh, inflation prices including sackboy returnal um Marvel Spider-Man Remastered, Miles Morales, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, Days Gone, and God of War 2018. According to PlayStation Lifestyle, who confirmed the findings, the aforementioned games experienced price jumps on Steam between April 14th and April 19th. However, much how much they cost now depends on how much they cost now depends on the year they were released. For example, Returnal may carry a higher price tag since it came out in 2021, while Horizon Zero Dawn may generously uh maybe generously cheaper given that it came out in 2017 if you live in any of the following countries here are the prices you will see uh here are the prices you will expect to see when you're looking for your favorite playstation we don't, games we in don't the need Steam to store. go through right them. 
Uh, Sony hasn't officially announced the price jumps for the PlayStation games on Steam. Uh, it's unknown if the price increases on Steam will affect the prices in other digital and physical retail storefronts in their respective regions or whether uh, even more regions can expect similar price increases. So I'm assuming they're doing that because of Steam's cut. Steam takes how much? Isn't it low? Isn't it I want to say it's, it was 30%, but I want to say now it's 20%. Because Epic, like, you know, came in and said, like, oh, we offer a higher cut. And it seems like, all right, fine, we'll offer a higher cut. Uh, according to Quora? No, wait. Protocol Media? Valve says Steam's 30% cut is still competitive. Right, well, that's... I'm sure that's old by now. That, this is old, yeah. Yeah. It's at least 30%. Well, I mean, it's at most 30%. That's a lot. That's that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, but PlayStation is used to taking all of it, not yeah. having a cut taken out because they have their own storefront. Uh, f- this was pu- this was a Verge article published uh, in March of this year. Epic takes twelve percent commission on games, meaning developers earn eighty eight percent. Valve generally takes thirty percent a cut on Steam, though that cut decreases if your game hits a certain sales milestone. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it starts at 30, and then the more successful your game is, the more money you make. Well, I'm sure PlayStation games are, are hitting that milestone. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, I, I understand why Sony would want to raise the price, uh, but it's just funny because of their whole deal with the, with the Microsoft yeah. situation. They're raising the price on other platforms. Yeah. That's like... <laughs> You I know. mean, we've already <laughs> seen Sony, like, they've raised the price of the PlayStation 5 in many other territories. They're afraid that Microsoft will raise the price of Call of Duty on their platform. Right. <laughs> they're, do- they're, they're projecting. They're afraid of somebody else owning Call of Duty because of what they would do if they owned Call of Duty. Yeah. Yeah, they would charge $80 in Canada for yeah. Call of Duty. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sony doesn't want Microsoft to acquire studios. Unlike them who just acquired Firewalk oh! Studios to the PlayStation family. That's now, who the segue. hell is that? Uh, this is a blog post by Herman Holtz, the head of PlayStation Studios. I'm excited to announce that we've expanded our relationship with Firewalk Studios and are thrilled to welcome them to the PlayStation Studios. Uh, Firewalk is home to a remarkably talented team of creatives who have launched some of gaming's most celebrated experiences and they are already hard at work with their first original AAA multiplayer game for PlayStation. Since announcing our publishing po- partnership with a Probably Monsters and Firewalk in 2021, we continue to be impressed by the team's ambitions to be a mo- to build a modern multiplayer game that connects its players in new and innovative ways. The studio shares our passion for creating inspiring worlds uh, grounded in exp- exceptional gameplay, and we want to continue to invest in their mission. We are excited for Firewalk to bring their technical and creative expertise to playstation studios to help grow our live service operations and deliver something truly special for gamers i don't know what they've made what games have firework oh what resident evil 4 remake no uh i think that i think that they are a support uh, studio support studio okay uh yeah this is an article from vg 24 7 okay uh so but now they are now they are working on a triple A multiplayer life service game. Uh, I think we saw like when Sony published when Sony bought uh, Bungie. Uh, the rumor at the time was like Sony was gearing up to make like a triple A online multiplayer like life service type game, mm-hmm. and I guess acquiring Firewalk like doubles down on that, which is interesting because we're sort of seeing like the end of the live service game trend. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh I mean the the studio has been working on its first official AAA multiplayer game. Um f- the the first official was throwing me off because it is the studio's first official. Yeah. I mean, what else have they freaking made? I guess yeah, they've been a support studio uh Resident Evil, according to VG247 Resident Evil 4, Pokémon Scarlet and Violet. Where are you? Can I did you pull that up in Google? Yeah. Because then I went to the article and I couldn't find it in the article. Okay. And it made me think that the article, that that Google pulled it from the wrong place. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. I'm not seeing. Yeah, it. look, look, popular now. Oh, Resident Resident Evil, Pokemon <laughs> Scarlet and Violet. There's oh. no way they did anything on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Yeah, that's yeah. that's Google just just messed that up. So yeah, we don't know what the hell they've made. Yeah. Uh, all we know is that it it is part of uh, Sony's plan to release live service games in an era where nobody wants live service games anymore. Sly Cooper fan quoted former Destiny developers. Are they? Are they? Because that's also owned Fire, by yeah. PlayStation. Firewalk oh. Studios is led by Tony Sue, Ryan Ellis, and Elena Sigmund, all of whom previously worked at Bungie, having worked on titles like Destiny, Call of Duty, Apex Legends, Mass Effect, and Halo. It's a new studio. Yeah. It's a new studio. It's a new studio. They spun yeah. off, made their own studio, and, and Sony's Sony, like, gotcha. Yeah, come come, come with here us. before Microsoft devours you in its maw and charges more money and get, <laughs> releases worse versions. That 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 makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. I mean, I like Destiny a lot. Yeah. So that would be really cool to see. It'd also be cool to see more Destiny. I'd like a third one. Well, that'd probably be made by Bungie. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But, you know, why are they requiring live service studios when it, the trend is like on its way out? <laughs> There's room for a good one. Good live service <laughs> games. Yeah. But like, like Destiny. Like Destiny is like the perfect live service but game. But the thing is that like live service games, you generally only play one. So like how yeah. are, like what are they gonna do to create the next one that you play? Make a next make a next destiny. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I don't think this is a live service situation as much as it is just a uh well no triple A multiplayer. It could be anything. It, it could be probably, anything. Probably, it's gonna be a fucking live service game. <laughs> <laughs> and so, then they're gonna delay it a year to remove the live service aspect of it. You know what really pisses me off? I jumped back into Destiny 2 the other day. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started a new character and I started it up and I was playing and I was like, this seems different. Like, yeah, I don't remember going through this. I remember the story was different. Like the story was like, so in Destiny, there's like the tower. It's like the hub yeah. world. The tower in the original Destiny 2, the tower gets destroyed. Right. And you have to like set up camp somewhere else. And you're like basically on the run the whole game. It's like really cool. Yeah. Um, None of that is there anymore. <laughs> Apparently, what happened is the base game is just deleted from existence. You cannot play the base game anymore. Really? Yeah, you can only play the DLC. Wow. The DL some of the DLC is free, but uh I own Destiny 2 and yeah. I've played Destiny 2 and I beat the game. Apparently, what I played is unavailable now. You wow. cannot play it. And when I went to go replay it, I was like arguing with people i was like no there's so much of of the base game to play like there's a whole campaign yeah. to play i played for like three hours and then you hit a wall where it forces you to buy the dlc is it one of those even though i have the disc <laughs> is it one of those things where if you play it like what you, you delete it from your playstation like you install it clean and you play it offline can you still play the base game like the original base game that is a good question yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna try that okay i'm gonna see if you can do that I ended up buying the DLC on Steam and playing it on, right. on PC. Um, I'm also really annoyed because uh, they added all this DLC. And in the game, you have a light level. That's like you're, you're the level. You're like power level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, if you play the game, if you beat the game, your level goes up. You have experience. The DLC makes it so that, you, that somewhere along the way, they updated it so that everybody is the same level. So... I beat the game and I have all these weapons, these cool weapons and armors and yeah. stuff. It's all the same level as somebody who just started playing the game. So my new character that I, I started a new fresh character. He was the exact same light level as the character that I spent like 20, 30 hours playing. So then what's the point? The point is everybody started somewhere along the way. De uh, Bungie was like, boom, everybody's on the same. Everybody starts over. Okay. Everybody has to start over. But the whole point of Destiny was like you keep progressing until yep. you get better and better at it. Yep. So now if if everyone's special, then nobody is. Exactly. It's fucking yeah. really annoying. Wow. Uh, the chat's saying no, you can't put the disc in and play because it needs. It's an online game. Yeah. But but there is a campaign. Yeah. You know you can play the whole game by yourself, but there's online components that I guess they kind of force you into. Yeah. 
I like the game a lot, but there's a lot of dumb bullshit that they've done to it. Anyway. Super tilt, bro. Why did I... I moved this up for some reason. <laughs> oh, this is uh, an, S, an NES game with built-in Wi-Fi. That's insane. Uh, in the 80s, multiplayer video games required you and your friend to crowd around at single TV and fight over who got to use one of the two controllers. Modern consoles let you compete against gamers from all over the world. But a new cartridge is bringing the same online functionality to the NES 40 years later. While most kids who grew up with the NES won't uh, won't learn about the internet until the 90s, the Japanese version of the console, the Famicom, actually offered unlimited internet connectivity through the family computer network system when it debuted in Japan in 1988. The chunky modem that connected to the Famicom's console cartridge slot connected to a dial-up information service to access random things like weather reports, stock info, and even game cheats. It was not commercially successful, but it's definitely not how Super Tilt Bros um, handles its online connectivity. Given Nintendo doesn't produce cartridges for the NES anymore, the Super Tilt Bro cart is a custom creation with a board that's been upgraded with an ESP8266 Wi-Fi chip, a Wi-Fi antenna, and an FPGA that allows an unmodified NES console to interface with the wireless hardware. The platform fighting game, which looks like a streamlined recreation of Super Smash Bros. Uh, featuring chibi-style characters, includes all of the Wi-Fi configurations within the game's own menu system, given the NES has no front end of its own as well as match settings allowing players to compete for fun, for rank, or to set up their own tournaments by creating and sharing private passwords with friends. Local play is also offered too uh, for those who like for those who like to compete against and trash talk players in the same room. Uh, if you're lacking wireless internet, there's even a single player story mode, though why bother buying an NES cart with Wi-Fi in it if you're not going to take advantage of the innovative upgrade. This is really cool. Yeah. It's 60 bucks on Kickstarter if you want the 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 cartridge. Yeah. I mean, that's what you want. Yeah. <laughs> that's the whole gimmick. Uh, although the development and testing of Super Tilt Bro game and cartridge is complete, its creators, Broke Studios, uh, are looking to raise funds through, kick, uh, through Kickstarter to help cover the manufacturing costs of the hardware. The cheapest way to get your hands on one of the cartridges uh, when they're expected to ship out in April of next year uh, is with a pledge of $61 to the campaign, which also gets you a proper <coughs> box, bless you, bless you, proper box and manual, as well as access to a digital comic book and copy of the game's soundtrack. With a pledge of $89, you can instead opt for the collector's edition, which also features a cartridge with a translucent shell showing off the Wi-Fi hardware. It's important to remember that even with a polished working prototypes, there's always the risk that it, uh, when it comes to uh, back and crowdfunding projects. Uh, of course, you should know that. Um, it's a good idea to have as much patience as possible. Also, keep in mind that any crowdfunding project could be completely canceled, which has happened from time to time. Yeah, so this looks <coughs> really cool. I'm skeptical that there's going to be anybody online playing these games. I know. Like, that's what, like... There needs to be people playing in order for there to be lobbies and And people stuff. playing at the same time. Yeah. You know, as of right now, uh, it has... 457 backers so that yeah they all have to be actively playing like a lot or at least the majority of them have to be yeah and are there going to be servers is it going to be peer-to-peer like like i'm very interested in how that's yeah i don't know if it uh if it goes into the specifics of it but also i feel like they should put this on pc just to get numbers up just for there there to be sheer yeah, numbers i think that's a good idea uh some sort of cross-platform play yeah i mean let it run in an emulator just so yeah. it's easier for people to get their hands on it so that you can just get more numbers so that there will be an active online community because yeah. having to plug in your nes is really cool but you, you you're not going to have anybody playing this game. Yeah. I don't know how long the the servers are going to be up for for something like this. Yeah, and and when is it going to go up? Because it's a Kickstarter thing, so they have to ship them all at once. And then how many weeks well, are you going to be playing this? Thing according for? to the Kickstarter campaign, the game is done, and that the Kickstarter is really just to cover the manufacturing cost of like actually putting things on chipsets and discs. Yeah, which and, uh, is the hard part. Yeah, so. <laughs> You know, it must it, it must work already. So like that's 
you know, that part is done. It's just well, well, that's the thing is that it works, but will it work at scale? Right. You know, like like it works when you have in a development environment two guys who want to play against each other. But what if you know I plug it into my NES and hit and, and hit search? Yeah. Like, is there gonna be somebody else on the other side? You know. I mean, maybe they're also banging on the fact that not everyone's gonna be playing this game at the same time. Y'all like yeah. overload it. Yeah. That's true too. I mean, it's it's probably gonna work in some sort of peer to peer situation. Yeah. But um, still like. I, I I need to know more technical details. Yeah, I'm gonna kickstart it. That sounds really there. You cool. go, uh, but it's not coming out till April next, next year. year. Yeah. yeah, so who knows? I've been burned. I think I got, have like a 50 percent success rate with kickstarters. Really? Yeah, I think 50 percent of them, the ones that I've backed, have actually come out. The first Kickstarter I ever backed was for the uh, movie adaptation of the comic book The Goon. I still yes, have the shirt. I remember that. I still have the shirt and the lithograph from it. Um, I don't think that's Cam coming out anytime soon. But if it does, I hope my name's still in the credits. <laughs> yeah, that. Nope. It's a uh, shame because that would have been a good one. And you know, the director of that movie was turned out to be the director of the Deadpool movie. Oh my god! So you think now he has some clout? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What the hell? He just yeah. scammed people out of and all their money. Fucking um, the producer of it was David Fincher. Oh. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. The first, apparently, the I just looked at my account. Is this written? No, show more pledges. Where, where? Unsuccessful. Oh, this is unsuccessful. Uh, I'm trying to see what the first one I ever. Uh, oh, it was a comic book, Giant Robot Warrior Maintenance Crew. It was a maintenance crew of a giant mech. That sounds fun. Uh, and then Video Game High School. You remember that? Yeah, that was successful. And then the Makey Makey, which I recently used in a video and then made a controller out of it. <laughs> a controller made out of dildos. And then Mighty Number no. 9. Ah, yes. And then the Carbone, a carbon fiber wallet, which was like a Ridge wallet, except it never shipped. Mm. <laughs> and I'm sure there's more. I actually kickstarted a lot of stuff. I haven't kickstarted that much. I've kickstarted more than I thought, but I don't know. I'm like very wary about it. Yeah, no, you. I kickstarted the fidget cube when that came out because, oh. like, I actually thought that was cool, and I bought a bunch of them because I, I, I needed. I'm like fidgety. Uh, all right, what's the Red Cross doing here? Okay, Besi- oh. besides sending me letters every other week <laughs> trying to get my money because I donated to them one time. That's that's how they get you. Donate once, and you're on their list forever. Okay. Uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross has partnered with a bunch of Twitch streamers to encourage gamers to not commit war crimes in popular shooters like Call of Duty. Oh, my God. The ICRC hopes that it its event, Play by the Rules, will educate players on the, statues, on the statutes of actual war. The organization has even created its own Fortnite mode to help communicate what those rules are. Every day, people play games set in conflict zones right from their couch. But right now, armed conflicts are more prevalent than ever, right? Uh, the ICRC website says. Um, and to the people suffering from those effects, this conflict is not a game. It destroys lives and leaves communities devastated. Therefore, we're challenging you to play first-person shooters by the real rules of war to show everyone that even wars have rules, rules which protect humanity on the battlefield IRL. Uh, as part of the event on the Red Cross's official Twitch channel, streamers have played a number of games that are adhering or attempting to adhere to the laws of conflict including PUBG, Fortnite, Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, uh, and Escape from Tarkov. Uh, In addition to play by the rules event, the Red Cross created its own Fortnite mode that's designed to convey the rules of war in the context of competitive play. For those curious, the official rules of war of the official rules of war on the Red Cross's play by the rules event are as follows. No thirsting, which is don't shoot down to our responsive enemies. Uh, no targeting nonviolent NPCs. No targeting civilian buildings and using med kits on everyone. All right, that the, the the two and three are normal. That yeah. sounds fine. No thirsting. That could be an interesting game mechanic. It could that be, you yeah. just can't kill a downed enemy. Yeah, you have to see if they get revived, and if they don't, they just. Just hope they don't get revived. That could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, use med kits on everyone. 
also interesting because then you just lose your med kit and yeah. then you can't med. But that's also well, that's resource management right there. You have to, you know, if you have one med kit and you got two down but, people, who are you going to save? But the rules of war are that you use their med kit on them. So like, if you get hurt, if we're in war together and right. you get hurt, I'm supposed to use your med kit right. on you. And and if you don't have one, I guess I use mine. Yeah. Um. In the chat, wannabe hero says that sounds like it sucks. <laughs> well, I mean, in fairness, actual war is not fun. Right, right. <laughs> um, I do think that this is an interesting challenge. I mean, and also to be clear, this is the easy one. There's a lot more rules of war out there that it is impossible to put into these games. Like I remember one. I think it was Modern Warfare Three, the original. You just commit a war crime, like, as part of the gameplay. Like, you have a you like have a guy strapped to a chair. You all put masks on, and then Price just opens up mustard gas, and, like in his face, and he's like, "Now you're gonna give me information." Like, that's a war crime, and that's part of gameplay. There's no way around that. Yeah. So at least they're trying to be reasonable here. So in, in this uh, little, I guess, piece of marketing. It looks like they're not shooting this guy because he's not looking. Like, yeah. so what? They have to be pointing their gun at you in order to shoot them? That makes well, it even harder. Well, yeah, because otherwise <laughs> it's not an enemy combatant. It's just a person. Right. You know, if they turn around and point their gun at you, then it's an enemy, an enemy Yeah, but combatant. I have to point the gun at them and wait for them to point the gun back. I mean, in real life, you'd probably be like, put the gun down. And yeah. then they turn around and point the gun and then you got to shoot them. What are they going to be like? There's gonna be a big red X over the over the the, the crosshair until I mean, they start shooting at you. I mean, they they said they created their own Fortnite mode, so I'm sure they can like, you know, police it better. If they're doing this in like Call of Duty, there's no way you're gonna fucking police this thing. Yeah. People are just gonna be committing more crimes left and right. Uh, K O Mega says, "How are you supposed to not shoot a civilian building? Aim better. Yeah, yeah. Aim good. You're, you're supposed like." Obviously, like every bullet counts. Yeah, obviously accidents happen, but like the the intent is to not destroy the building. Yeah, I'm sure you'll get like points off or something. Yeah. Th there's room for an interesting game, I think. Yeah, like, but I don't think the Red Cross has the uh, capability to make a good game. No, I think I think it's more so like raising awareness for like what actual wars are like, and also like obviously this is a fundraising thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with donating to the Red Cross. It's Bob did it once, and he's happy about it. I don't know. People say like they 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 take like doesn't their CEO make like a fuck ton of money or something? Probably. Yeah. You know, there's no you know everybody sucks. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's like it seemed fine. That's why I donated <laughs> to it. <laughs> um, Matt, uh, where is it? Matt of Astora says, I just got here. How are we already talking about <laughs> war crimes? You've come to the right yeah, podcast. Yeah, welcome to friend. the Wolf Dead podcast where we just talk about war crimes. Uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Patches. Speaking of war crimes. <laughs> is there anything good here? Version uh, 1.3 uh, war, uh, war crimes. Uh, patch notes. <laughs> Features adjustment. A change has been made to the deadline for entries for friendly competitions oh cool dude bug fixes oh wow because there's a lot of those yeah. link battles okay i don't care about the link battles battles fix a bug where the cud chew ability would trigger again okay fix a bug that occurred when okay fix a bug that occurred when Z zorak who the hell is zorak he was the co-host of space ghost I coast to coast <laughs> i was gonna say that uh is it actually zorak though I mean, that's not how you spell Zorak. Without the O. Yeah. But it is. His name was Zorak. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fix the bug in double battles. Okay. Pokemon Go connectivity. Other. Fix the bug affecting trainers who received uh, Zorak. It's all about <laughs> Zorak, dude. The game's still going to be fucking broken running at four frames a second. Other select bug fixes have been implemented. That's their... Overall, we're working on it. Every time there's a patch, everybody goes, "Oh wow, I feel like it runs better," and it doesn't. <laughs> so it it probably runs like barely better, mm -hmm. like just enough to notice, but not enough to make it playable. Right. So this game seems interesting. Police body cam shooter. Yes. Speaking of war crimes, 
This looks really cool. This looks like actual yes. real life footage. I like I almost didn't put this in here, but like literally every gaming website was talking about this game. So like we have to talk about it. I, I want to play this for sure. Independent Game Studio made a big splash this week with footage of its project Unrecorded, a first-person shooter in which players take on the role of a police detective. What sets Unrecorded apart from its contemporaries is its presentation. Players witness the action through a slightly warped lens of a police body camera. Unrecorded. Now, there is noticeably war crimes in this because oh, yeah. I don't think he calls out like freeze. I think he just starts shooting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unrecorded looks unsettlingly real due to its Unreal Engine 5 powered photorealistic graphics, but there's more to the game's presentation than just convincing lighting and believably derelict buildings. The fisheye lens distortion and herky jerky movement as the player chases down and shoots the, at suspects looks nearly indistinct from real life body cam footage uh, that we've seen inundated at, uh, with as police departments release similar footage to the public, often for incredibly distressing reasons. In fact, some viewers have questioned whether the gameplay footage of Unrecorded is gameplay footage at all. The studio behind it, known as Drama, says it is. We do not use any real videos or external renderings it promised on its FAQ. This looks real because <laughs> of the vignetting and the fisheye effect. Yes. Like, like it's, it looks awesome. It looks real. But it's just Unreal Engine 5 in, yeah. in a shot with a unique lens yeah. that we haven't really seen uh, the before. game is developed on unreal 5 and the footage is captured from an executable and played with a mouse and keyboard it is not a vr game in reality it seems rather flattering to compare the graphics of unrecorded to reality but fortunately we know that the game first focuses on gameplay and universe on which we primarily coordinate uh, considering the high production cost of a video game and our global reputation at stake uh, if unrecorded were a scam it would be a blockbuster scam <laughs> Uh, Jim Slatterns up in the chat says they had a question in the FAQ about if the game is pro cops or anti cops. <laughs> I'm going to say it's probably neither, but, uh, after watching the trailer, I don't think it, it feels wrong. Like, it yeah, just, it just, like I was actually like kind of like horrified by the, like it was scary. Like you yeah. felt like scary terrifying yeah I, I mean i've seen enough police body cam footage where like you understand so in some cases you're like you understand where the cops perspective is yeah. they're terrified it yeah. is terrifying oh, yeah. to be in that situation yeah. where you don't know where the guy's hand are maybe they yeah. they can pull something out and you're dead within a split second but there's also police body cam footage where you're like this cop is a fucking asshole yeah so like i feel like this is both yeah this is both of those situations this is putting you in the perspective of the cop where it is scary and it's also making you the asshole where you're shooting at a guy who's running yeah without calling out to freeze yeah so it's both. It's both of those things. So, yeah. I know that, like, there's been a lot of reaction to this, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it ranges from, like, oh, this is cool. It's all oh, this is terrible. And, like, people actually saying this shouldn't, like, you should not make a game about this. I don't agree with that. I feel yeah. like, I, I feel like games have a right as, like, any other art form to, like, express a situation including police body cam footage i think the problem with video games is that the interactivity of it because once you give this to a player it's in their hands and they could take it the wrong way they could just you know treat it as like a rambo simulator yeah. and rather than trying to actually be like a properly trained cop also like you know people still think that like games are just super mario brothers and pac-man yeah and like anything more violent, anything Grand Theft Auto level turns you into a, a pedophile serial killer who's going to shoot up a school. So yeah, I mean it, it's it. You're right. Like any other medium, you're, you're allowed to. Yeah, because I'm to, sure to there show. are there are movies that like do this exact same thing. Yeah, but that's okay because it's a movie. There's movies where people kill civilians. Yeah, just like there's games where people kill yeah. civilians. Um. Anyway, last thing, FTC reportedly wants info from Nintendo on Call of Duty deal. Why yes. Nintendo specifically? They want it from... Oh, uh, that, let's read the article to find out. Uh, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is attempting to get more information from Nintendo regarding the 10-year licensing deal it signed with Microsoft to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo platforms. In a report published by Tweaktown via My Nintendo News, the FTC apparently subpoenaed in order to produce documents or information related to a case. Nintendo of America's vice president of publisher and developer relations, Steve Singer, after learning that Singer was responsible for the discussions between Nintendo and Microsoft. 
The FTC reportedly wants the exec to stand and give a testimony for up to seven hours. Well, this is related to the Microsoft Activision merger. The details of this specific subpoena were directly related to the deal between Nintendo and Microsoft, which was struck on the 6th of December, 2022. Nintendo has tried to... Nintendo has tried to get the subpoena dismissed, calling it untimely in a previous report from Tweaktown. Uh, you can read the full public records of the dismissal here. The deadline for the subpoena was March 3rd, and the FTC only submitted it between the uh, 29th and the 30th of March after asking for the identity of Nintendo's negotiator on March 16th. Uh, if the judge agrees with Nintendo, the company may not need to provide any additional information regarding the 10-year deal. Legal proceedings on the Microsoft Activision merger have been big news over the past four months, and sister site uh, Pure Xbox shared a statement from the Financial Times earlier today that suggests the CMA in the UK is expected to approve the deal. The FTC is attempting to collect as much information as possible relating to the upcoming merger in order to block the $69 billion merger. Uh, if and when Call of Duty games come to the Switch, it will likely take a while after the merger has gone through uh, for Call of Duty games to appear on other platforms until Microsoft and Activision get into a rhythm. Okay, so I, it sounds like they want Nintendo to come out and talk about how Microsoft wants to do the deal with them. Yeah, because like what were the terms of the deal? How are they bringing this to Nintendo? Is it actual Call of Duty? Because might, that might be a big thing because if they're not bringing like Call of Duty proper, they're just bringing a Call of Duty game to Switch, that could be ammo at Sony's uh, court. Yeah, and the whole Microsoft's whole argument is, look, we're playing fair yeah. and they need to... They can't grill Microsoft. Yeah. Microsoft's going to say, yeah, no, we're playing fair. They need to grill Nintendo, mm. who should be bipartisan. Yeah. And they... They they have to say you know it's a fair deal, but yeah, uh, they could also say that 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 it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but I doubt that they will. I, I feel like Nintendo clearly wants no part of this. Yeah, I mean, because like Sony's making a big stake left and right. Other game companies are making a big stake left and right. Nintendo's like just, just do whatever. Here's here's a Mario game. Yeah, <laughs> we got Tears of the Kingdom coming out. It's gonna be better than any game you put out this year. So right. yeah. So we'll see where that lands, I guess. Yeah. Uh, GCXC Luke, thanks for gifting a sub. Thank you. Also, thank you for this tweet of the week. Tweet of the week! Tweet of the week! Tweet of the week! This is a quote tweet. The original tweet was from The Retro Room, who says, Have you ever been here before? And it's the Windows screensaver with the yes. brick maze. And then our buddy Jerry quote tweeted and said, Yes, my dad forgot I was in there and I was stuck for hours. <laughs> I'm just picturing him because like, he would actually be stuck there for hours. Yeah. Dad? Dad! <laughs> anyway, so no Sega unionized news? No. What what happened? Uh, Sega of America is like... Uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're petitioning to unionize. Yay. Good we'll we'll talk about it when they do. Like, and that's good for them. I'm happy for them. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, it it feels like that should be a normal thing. Yeah, like this is a big trend that's going to happen more and more. We can't report on every, uh, we can't report on every studio that starts to unionize. Yeah. Uh, nineteen ninety five, Poppy. Thanks for the subscription. Uh, we're gonna talk to you guys. Yes, right now. starting with people who have comments on next week's Wolfden Podcast over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com dot slash Wolfden Podcast. Yeah, like uh, who's over there? Like Doomy Doomy, who says, almost dropped my phone on the treadmill having my comment in the podcast. This is what fangirls feel like. Good thing for my 14 Pros sturdy case. Yes, always make sure your phone is in a case. Don't believe people who like have their phones be naked. Like a case to five case. Use code WolfDen, I think. <laughs> I don't remember. You know, everybody comments me, with me on this case, and you were like, I don't like this case. Everyone likes this case. That's, that's, uh, you got it because it's an ugly case. <laughs> I, nobody, not one person I show this to says that's an ugly case. Okay. Interesting. It, it, for, for podcast listeners, it is a broccoli. Give me it. It, it, is, is, a, it is, broccoli. is a broccoli that is... Uh, it's a kaiju-sized broccoli attacking Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, it's very strange. My daughter loves it. Mine is uh mine was supposed they were supposed to give me one that was black. Okay. That was like a black mirror. Yeah. Like finish. And they gave me a clear one. Uh and it says Wudufu 
in the, in the uh, in, in, like wolf yeah that's in, us. In, in, in katakana and it was supposed to be like black so you could barely see it yeah but now I, don't, I, don't, I don't know they screwed up anyway uh lugi sp says the reason why towers in breath of the wild are okay is because when you activate them it only shows the geography of the area and ubisoft games they spelled out Ubisoft. <laughs> Ubisoft games, you activate a tower and it puts a million, a billion different points of interest that it wants you to go to, giving you busy work. That's true. Like as soon as you like activate a tower in a Ubisoft game, it's like, oh, you got to collect these things and these things and these things and these things. Also, it's required. Yeah. Like in a Ubisoft game, you unlock all of the, the, the points of interest and a lot of times those are missions. Yeah. And you need them to be on the map in order for you to know what to do. And in Breath of the Wild, you could just blindly start yeah. doing stuff. You don't really need the map. It's just help, more helpful if you yeah. have the map. Trevor Grover says, dragons are the coolest thing to stumble upon in Breath of the Wild. Never done it. I feel, like, for Ganon. I feel like dragons are the coolest thing to stumble upon anywhere. <laughs> Put them in anywhere. Yeah. Put them in anything. It's cool. Yeah. Like remember in Mario Odyssey, there was a fucking dragon. That's true. That, you that was upon weird. That? Yeah, that was weird and very out of place. Yeah. Nick Province says, "I believe the black and white handles on the Zelda Pro controller are meant to represent Link's hands in the game. One is normal and the other is corrupt and black." Hmm, that's a good point. Yeah, but make it green. <laughs> it, it should have been a more colorful controller. Yeah, his hands green. Yeah. State skate is high 85 84 says why is the beginning of every podcast a disaster you know our mother <laughs> fucking tweeted that to us i think your comment tweeted why is the <laughs> beginning of every podcast a disaster and she neither did. of us answered she her did. because that's so annoying yeah when we hear it from our mother <laughs> look man we're always trying to up it a little bit yeah. eventually and there's two of us here yeah so you didn't fucking cameras are switching all over the place. <laughs> like, no one's producing this. Yeah. A robot is producing. Yeah. It's amazing that this thing works. At you should all. be lucky that we're even having a show. Yeah. At the quality that it is, we <laughs> could just go back to doing it a remote and yeah. just, just have Would a you split like that? screen. Or you want yeah. that? I don't want to do that because I got kids and I like to yell. So <laughs> I don't want to wake them up. Jesus. Ugh. Could I have done the bomb rush cyberpunk no. at home? No, I would have gotten a nasty look from my wife. <laughs> All right, now we're in the chat. Okay. Well, Taku Sam says, I went to GameStop today hoping to pick up those Metroid Dread Amiibos for five bucks, but apparently they were only on sale last week. Oh, yeah, they were, oh, they were, they were, you... the two packs for five bucks. I meant to the get The two those. pack? Yeah. That's the, crazy. The Dread Amiibos? Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, all right, say some good stuff so we can yeah. respond. Uh, what do you got, chat? Uh, Fry friend Nard says, please play some, please play some good trackpad games before passing judgment on the trackpad. Tell me a good trackpad game, <laughs> and I'll tr with a demo. I don't want to spend any money. Yeah, <laughs> you. But you, the 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 best implementation of a trackpad is a mouse, right? Yeah, it's doesn't work half the time <laughs> in the in the desktop version yeah. of Steam. So, and I think the click is the trigger, not the press. Yeah. So, it's fucking weird. Yeah. Uh, I hate when people say my ears when we get loud. We have everything like relatively normalized. Yeah. So like, lower your up. volume. Yeah. Uh. Edward Bova says, Bob, it feels like it feels that she's I don't I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it feels that she sounds like you have to be part of Team 17 or Devolver Digital or Tiny Build or some other big indie publisher like that in order to get a good spot in uh, the indie in the indie showcase. Unfortunately, I just think that um a lot of people are really excited about the big indie games. Yeah. People aren't really judging the games that are in the indie world on their own merit. They right. they want a lot of hype around it. And unfortunately, 
those big publishers like Devolver Digital have a lot of hype around them. Yeah. It's not I mean, that might factor into why it's in a good spot in the direct. But also Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, biggest yeah. deal. Uh slide what, was it uh, yeah. It was in the slide. Sizzle show. reel. So I don't I don't I don't know. I it, it's just an unfortunate way of the world, I guess. Yeah. Um uh, is it worth buying a Switch this late in its life cycle, hoping for some better hardware soon to use to steady 60 frames per second from gaming? What? <laughs> uh, FMP Samantha is basically asking, is it worth getting a Switch this late in its life cycle? That's a good question. You know, if you asked me like two months ago, I would have said, yeah, sure. You know what? Get a Switch Lite. 200 bucks. Can't yeah. go wrong. And pre-owned if you could at this yeah. point yeah that's great i think a new it also depends on your level of buyer's remorse i think you could buy a switch right now even for 350 dollars if you get the oled yeah i think you could buy one of those and be perfectly happy for a whole year yeah i do think that next year will be some new hardware though so yeah. you you it depends on the level of your buyer's remorse. There is so many phenomenal games that are yeah. on Switch right now that you are missing out on by not having a Switch. Um, but again, are you going to be disappointed if they announce something in December? Yeah. Uh, Tynology says, are you using advanced scene switcher plugin for the camera switching? Yes. And uh, I had to reset it up right before we started, and I think I made it so it limits it to five seconds each camera, which is a problem. I need to <laughs> We're 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 yeah. working towards a a good time here. Um, uh, it's still a really solid console, but there may be a switch to in one or two years. Yeah, that there's always people who are going to be upset when a, when they buy something and a new one comes out. I mean, there's also there's going to be a switch two in one or two years for the past two or three years yeah. now. So yeah. I think people are sleeping on the Steam Deck still. But I mean Are they though? It's it's just Nintendo has a lot of great first party stuff. They're right. never gonna get anywhere yeah. else. Yeah. That that's the big thing. Trackpad mapped to screen area makes playing twin sticks a lot more ergonomic, i.e. cross code. Admittedly better on the Steam controller with the round trackpad. There is I need to try this like is that the there's there's this I, I saw this video about this type of controller setup that is implemented in the Steam Deck that seemed really interesting to me. It was like the right stick. It's, I, I can't I, I it's it's really flick stick. Is that it? Is it might be flick stick. It's really hard What's to What's it trying to it's like a gyro situation. Okay. I, I I'm never gonna be able to find the original video that I that I found in. Oh, this was it. It was it was Epox Vox and uh it's on the Nerd Nest podcast. Uh it, I saw it in like a clip, like a TikTok clip or something, and I saw it. Oh, this is it. Uh, I don't think I can. Oh, I can. I just pulled up a video of someone doing it in Doom while you're describing it because it wasn't making sense watching this, like how it was playing until you described it. Oh, they're it. not going to show it. That feels like an evolution of the the on rails uh, light gun games at the arcade because you didn't have actual movement controls and you just had to like, you know, flick the gun over. Yeah, I I found one that I think was Doom. Okay. And yeah, it looks it it looks yeah. insane. Now I can't find it, but yeah, I think it's called flick stick. It's very hard to explain, but but basically your your rotational movement is like it's an exact one to one. I think it might flick back. I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. It's it's very strange. Sounds strange. Yeah, I'll have to try to find the video later. Um. Anyway. Fortnite has flick stick aiming built in. It's pretty neat on PS5. Uh, 
right stick is 360 degrees. You point it to the direction you want to aim. Yes. Yes. That, that, this, I, I found it. Okay. I found it. So watch this. If you press down on the right stick, you look directly behind you. Okay. If you press right, you look directly to the right of you. Okay. So it's a one to one. Got it. Yeah. It's very strange. And then you aim with the gyro, like 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 you do the micro adjusting with Got the gyro. It. Oh, I'm yeah. not gonna fucking like that. I, it sounds really cool. Have you done gyro aiming I've in, done gyro. in games? No, I've done gyro aiming, but it also has like the, the traditional camera movement on the right stick. Yeah. So like I would have to rewire my brain to get used to the right stick now doing something different. Yeah. No, you would. So so. I like gyro aiming for micro adjustments. Like when yeah. you're like sniping or something, you you aim like you traditionally would with the twin sticks, and then you you just kind of give it a little a yeah. little extra yeah, with yeah. the with the gyro, and it works awesome in certain games. Uh, but I want to try flick stick. That sounds really cool. I don't know what game I would try it on with yeah. the with the Steam Deck. I think it's built into the Steam Deck, so I guess I could just. I, I think anything, I yeah. I might still have Apex on there. Anyway, is that it? I think that's it. Okay. Guys, thanks for hanging out. Thank everybody. you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolfden Podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolfden. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. We're also on audio podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and your preferred podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get the show from, folks, Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all those respective platforms. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm not going to be around for this week. Uh, I will be back on Sunday. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll see you then on Twitch, everybody. Um, I mean, the, 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 if you're a podcast listener, everything's going to be normal. I'm still going to have a video out on Thursday and whatever. Uh, right now, go watch AJ. And uh, I'll, hey, I'll see y'all later. Goodbye. Bye. I still don't know what the buy button is. Found it. Get it.